Thanks for tuning in to That's What I Call Marketing, the CAN Sessions. Brought to you by Friedman International, the international campaign experts taking the pain out of your multi-market campaigns. I'm your host, Connor Byrne, and having worked with Friedman International in my previous role as a global marketing leader, I've experienced firsthand their deep level of expertise and attention to detail as the go-to experts for all international campaign needs. Now, let's get right into today's episode of That's What I Call Marketing, The Can Sessions. Welcome to That's What I Call Marketing, The Can Sessions, brought to you by Friedman International. Of course, this is the podcast where you'll hear from the leading lights in the marketing world and listen to their unique insights. Before we start, I can ask you one favor, please, if you can rate or review this episode or any of the episodes that you have enjoyed, wherever you're listening or watching. It really helps us build and reach an amazing community of engaged marketers just like you. If you are interested in getting involved with That's What I Call Marketing, our sponsorship kit is now available on our website. That's what I call marketing.com forward slash sponsor. So today is another double header from Cannes. It's a two parter and we're going to meet, first of all, Jerry D'Angelo, former VP of Global Media at P&G. And then I'm going to meet with Jer Rowe of Publicist. Publicist Dublin and Mark Noble of Heineken Ireland to talk about the multi can award winning pub museum. In part one, I meet Jerry D'Angelo. Jerry is an advisory board member to portfolio of companies and senior advisor at McKinsey and Co. And previously, Jerry was vice president of global media at Procter and Gamble, one of the world's largest advertisers. There he had responsibility for overseeing the company's media investment and managing relationships with media agencies and global digital platforms. Prior to that, he held senior media roles at Mondelez and Samsung. He also served as chair of the World Federation of Advertisers Media Forum and was a founding member of the Global Alliance for Responsible Media. Jerry is a high profile industry forum leader and contributor and mentors new entrants to the industry from diverse backgrounds. So it was great to find time with Jerry at Cannes. In this conversation, we discuss his observations on the changes he's seen at Cannes over the past 15 years from the traditional palais focus Cannes to the tech oriented outer perimeter Cannes. Jerry reflects on his tenure at P&G and his navigation to advisory roles with so many companies eager for his expertise and listening today, you will understand why. He shares insights on the integration of external perspectives of P&G, the shift towards insourcing and decoupling creative production for efficiency. Jerry advises companies to treat media like a supply chain, carefully balancing insourcing and outsourcing while ensuring flexibility to adapt to value generating tasks. He discusses the complexities and considerations of media talent management, emphasizing the importance of aligning on key goals to prevent unnecessary tough roars something Jerry reflects on at, from his previous years and saying that he wasted about 75% of time on things that really didn't matter. We conclude the episode with an exploration of cross-media measurement, advancements, the critical role of trade associations, and Jerry's views on technology's impact on traditional marketing functions. Jerry, thanks a million for no joining problem, me on so. That's What I Call Marketing. A bit of a, a journey to find a space, but we got Vidmob we did. and they've got a space yes. for us. So thank you, Vidmob. Thank you, Vidmob. Um, this delighted that you could join us sure. here. Uh, not your first can? Uh, no, I think this is can number 15 maybe for okay, me, so okay. somewhat of a veteran. How How is it different this year? Are you kind of getting a sense of I think CAN has evolved gradually uh, over a long period of time. I don't actually think there's one CAN, I think there's two CANs. Okay. I think the first CAN is what happens inside the Palais yes. and the sort of outer perimeter. And that is very much focused on the talks on the two main stages, the work that's down in the basement that everyone's encouraged to walk the work, uh, and then the award ceremonies in the evenings. But I think increasingly over a period of time, it's the other can that's outside of the, the, the yeah. perimeter of the Palais that is much more tech orientated. And I think that the second can is in a way sort of eating the first one right? in terms of numbers of people, in yeah. terms of the conversations that are happening, in terms of the financial investment that's being made. And the financial investment for the, for the first one is not insignificant. 
Um, but if you look at the yachts and the suites and the rooftop terraces, it really seems that, that Cannes has bifurcated into these two over a yeah. period of time. Even that, like the speakers on some of the stages yeah. across, you know, th those kind of the beaches and all yeah. that kind of stuff is, yeah. is amazing. Yeah. I definitely have a bit of FOMO of what I'm not, yeah. not going to yeah, see. Yeah, yeah, no, absolutely. absolutely. I, uh, there was a tipping point for me, though. I think it might have been uh, Yoko Ono one year being interviewed by uh, someone from Crispin Porter, I think it was, and halfway through the interview, she clambered into a tent that was on stage. <laughs> and I, there was something to do with uh, flashlights, and she got everyone in the audience to use a little mini flasher. And I thought, okay, now this is jump the shark, <laughs> right? Do I really need to be here? Uh, and, uh, and from then on, I think I've, I've gone down the, 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 the can two route. <laughs> oh, it's gonna be well. Listen, you're well known for your time at, mm -hmm. at P&G yeah. and is it a year since you yeah I retired at the end of June uh, 22 so it's coming up for a year yeah uh, end of this month how's, it'll be. how's that been so um, well look it's turned out much much more positively than I could have expected um, I knew that in fact when I interviewed for the job at P&G back in the summer of 16 I think it was I remember being one of the offices high up in the in the in the two towers uh, in Cincinnati and I said one of the responses I gave to the the question the interview questions was um, was along the lines of I want this to be my last job and then I want to retire because once you've ended up working at a company of such scale and influence and you've got quite a senior role within that organization yeah. uh, it's hard to imagine going on to do something else and so I thought that, that once I was able to retire, um, I would then look at a number of, of non-exec roles. And then I realized actually there's a fiduciary responsibility that comes with that. And I didn't want to be on a audit subcommittee of some, right. yeah, yeah. Uh, like a cardboard company. So I didn't want to do that. And then I realized actually that there was a very rich vein of advisory work. And there were one or two companies that I was working with that I was very familiar with from my time at P&G, but actually subsequent to me announcing my retirement, there were lots and lots of people that reached out to me either directly uh, through email or text or on LinkedIn. And then I went through a, a, a sort of filtering process. And if I was able to put a big tick next to people and product, okay, um, could I make a meaningful contribution to those companies? W was I ha Would I be happy to be... Uh, lending them some of my personal equity, are they making the world a, a, be a net better place? Okay. And if the answer to that was, was yes, um, then, um, then I was very happy to kind of lend them some help. And lots of experience that you have. I mean, mm -hmm. P&G was yeah. a, a bit of a beast, I'm gonna say. I yeah. mean, that is a huge yeah. organization yeah. overseeing global media. Yeah. Um, when you went in, what were, what were the things you kind of observed and saw and kind of the, Maybe so, the challenges or opportunities. So I didn't realize this at the time, but um, afterwards I realized that there was clearly an imperative, maybe a short-lived imperative, but definitely an imperative around sort of 2014, 15 um, to hire from the outside. And that was very, very unusual for P&G. Okay. Normally P&G recruits straight out of university or grad school or from, from uh, in people who've interned there. And, and people are encouraged up you know, up through the organization uh, their development career planning and, and and succession management is very very important within P&G and I just was in the right place at the right time and I was very lucky that at a point in time where counter to some of the prevailing uh, uh, approach before they were prepared to hire from the outside right. so, so I came from the outside and I think what they really wanted me to do was provide an external perspective and so I looked at a lot of things and and you know as a company hugely impressive as a company yeah. like operational excellence that you just wouldn't believe unless you saw it up close and uh, they were very very good at, at operating but I think what was happening was that as an organization particularly from a media perspective they were on a particular trajectory right um, and I think I was able to make a contribution to maybe giving them some insight as to how the external ecosystem worked uh, how to get the best out of agencies, uh, the evolving uh, role of, of technology companies and big platforms, 
And so I think I was able to kind of just maybe shift that trajectory a lot. And then they're well on their way now to delivering in their normal operational excellence. Yeah. You did start, you start to bring some stuff in-house as well. Yeah. Uh, I can't talk about that in a huge amount of detail. Right. But um, you're seeing now a growing trend a, a across a number of, of very large companies, not just in media, but also in, for example, decoupling, uh, creative ideation and production, and maybe bring some of that production. I think Unilever have yep. done that with, uh, I think it's called U-Hubs, I think it's called. Um, so you're seeing that trend a lot, and I think a lot of companies that are doing that are realizing that actually media is a, a very complex supply chain. I think you saw it from the ANA programmatic report last year where you, you saw the, the waterfall of money yeah. with like 38 cents on the dollar actually getting to the publisher um, and take rates all along that. And so I think a lot of advertisers are thinking, well, along that supply chain, if, if value is being created or dissipated along that supply chain, to what degree can we look at things in a different way? And insourcing is one component of that. Right. Uh, so lots of companies now are looking at insourcing, particularly those sort of higher value strategic activities okay. like insights, strategic planning, channel choice, and to some degree, uh, activation of campaigns. Uh, so I don't think it, it, it can be said of P&G, but I think it's also applicable to many other companies who are doing a similar thing. Definitely. And, but it it's a balance then as well for like using agencies as well. It wasn't all like we're taking all this in house. There was a, you were using agencies as well. No, I, I think that if, and I, I've been talking to lots of other advertisers since I retired and they're, they're asking themselves the same question, you know, should we in house or should we, should we uh, continue to outsource to the agency? And I think um, the right thing to do is ask that question. Yeah. Um, but, I don't think it's the right thing to do to do a sort of massive binary, are oh, we going to pull everything in-house? Like there've been lots of instances where there've been full starts, like Vodafone in the UK, I think a number of years ago, brought all their digital media buying in-house, and then about a year later, they pushed it all back to the agency because right. they could do it. So it's not a small undertaking. You have to think about this really, really carefully because you're moving money around in the P&L. You might be moving money from the marketing budget to the overheads budget. You might be increasing headcount. And then once you've started to do those things, you then have a responsibility for the people that you do bring yeah, in-house. Yes. And, yeah. and I think a lot of people don't think about that early enough in the process. And so the advice I would give to any advertiser is, is treat media like a supply chain. Look at where value is generated or lost and then be really thoughtful about, is, this, is it something you can eliminate? Um, is it something you can automate? Is it something that you should in-house in or is it something that you should outsource to an agency? And the first two should be considered equally alongside in-housing in and, and uh, in-sourcing and outsourcing yeah. because those two things, if you look at even very tactical things like supply path optimization, a lot of that is you're just eliminating lots of unnecessary hops in the in the supply chain. Yeah, yeah. So that's what I would say. I would say look at it look at it end to end, look at it in sort of modular way, look at it from a the lens of value, and then be flexible to make choices along that whole spectrum of automation, elimination, insourcing and outsourcing. And it's interesting you, you mentioned the people. I Johnny Cahill is CMO of Heineken in the USA, he talked about that challenge of kind of in and out of you know, he was like mm -hmm. I could bring in so I can see the advantage of bringing people in for some programmatic things, but he, he said, I don't know what I would do with their careers. Yeah, no, that's a great point. I mean, uh, I, I think that there are companies like P&G that are very strong on managing people's careers, uh, but even for companies like P&G, I think it's a challenge. Yeah. Uh, because by definition, a lot of media people are have quite specialized uh, expertise. Yeah and work in very specialized functions. And so if you bring in someone that's a social media buyer, you know, where do you move them? I mean, potentially you could move them to other media functions, you can move them to, to other geographies, but are they gonna make a jump into general brand management? Yeah. You know, I'm not saying that they can't do that, but, but, it, it's, but not it's, gonna be, it's gonna be hard. Yeah. Yeah. Um, so I think you have to think very, very carefully about those choices and just make sure that you're thinking both in the long term and also in the short term. And how did you think about, you know, obviously P&G, massive global 
footprint. Um, yeah. How do you then think about kind of that local and international balance and how you're getting that right? Because it's a it's a challenge. Just from a media perspective, yeah. yeah. Well, and and I would say this of of all companies. Um, Every company that I've been at and everyone I've talked to when I was at Mondelez as an example, um, the whole global to local thing can get can become a bit of a tug of war. Yeah. And it become it can become quite demarcational and quite emotive. And and actually in most recent years I've realized that if you can align people on a small number of things in the media space that you can control that demonstrably contribute towards business growth and get them aligned like we're gonna like the equivalent would be from a mountaineer we're gonna climb k2 right in the next six months you know a very you could argue quite a lofty goal once you've got people aligned to that then it's really easy to then you know you define the the what then you can kind of be more relaxed about the how okay so if if you've got a uh, an operational template that says success in media means xyz and that drives the business then who cares what agency you're using because everyone's marching to the beat of the same drum it doesn't really matter if you're with one holding company or another yeah i mean there, there may be sourcing considerations but that to me was the big aha i, I realized that 75 percent of the the hotly contested debates that i had over the course of my career i didn't need to have <laughs> they were like I spent a lot of emotional energy, and I'm thinking way back in my career when I was at Samsung or I was at Mondelez, I realized I didn't need to get into those sort Debates. of turf wars. Yeah. Because, you know, if you're aligning to a broader objective, then who cares really what agency? Uh, unless, of course, the broader objective is something that's ingrained in an agency choice. I mean, it could be. You know that you might be working at a company that has a big efficiency play. Yeah. And so, therefore, consolidating suppliers is a way to get there. Not the only way to get there, but it is a way to get there. Um, but that's my that's one it's, of my big takeaways. You know, uh, it's fascinating, it? but it's 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 with hindsight or, or experience that you get to that point of going, mm. I waste a lot of time and energy. But a lot of people do waste time and energy on it because they're actually saying, Oh no, but we're central. You know, therefore we have to. You know, put our stamp on, and yeah, you know, it's yeah, I, that doesn't work. No, no, no. That well, you, it, it works for uh, a short period of time, or it works in a limited number of cases. The sort of con command and control function, unless you're in a really hierarchical type of company. And when I worked at Samsung, that was a very hierarchical company. But right. even then, uh, and they, I think that at the time they moved into a single agency, I think they moved into Publicis when I was working there back in, gosh, whenever it was, 2006 to 2009, they moved into a single agency and they had a number of, of sort of high level imperatives, but that was a cultural thing. Yes. It was a Korean societal and business culture approach. It still rankled with lots of people in lots of different markets, but I think that's very much the exception. Yeah, yeah, no, it's... Um it is interesting, but it comes. Yeah, it's, it comes. With it. So people need to listen to Jerry. <laughs> the experience you had. Yes. Don't waste seventy five percent of your yes, time on yes, things that don't matter. Yes. <laughs> well, I'm hopeful now that a lot of that hard won experience I can share with other people yeah. uh, across the range of the portfo uh, portfolio of advisory uh, clients that I have. Things would have changed. It's always changing. Things change rapidly all the time. But yeah. I guess in your time at P and G, but even in the last year, things yeah. have changed phenomenally. Just with, I mean, look, technology is all over Cannes yeah, this year. Yeah, yeah. Um, how are you viewing kind of the advent of those so, tools? So I can look at it from at least, I can look at it from two perspectives. The first one is I started in media um, before the first Gulf War. And so back then media was a very, I didn't think it at the time, but looking back now, it was very, very, very simple. You had a telephone, you had a computer. Yeah. Within a year or two, I think. Uh, sorry, you had a telephone, a calculator. And within a year or two, I think I had a computer. Um, there was very, very little. Uh, da well, there was almost no data used, I think, apart from uh, cost data, and uh, and a little bit of quality data. And there was virtually no technology that was used. So it was very, very simple and straightforward. And so if you fast forward to now, it feels like, and many large advertisers are saying this. It feels like 
they're weighed down by lots and lots of technology and data imperatives. You've got to use this, yes, you've got to yeah. do that. And there are lots and lots of companies. And so it does feel like a, a number of these big companies are sort of weighed down by all these different things. And they're like, oh my, how did I end up with all this stuff? Um, and, I, and I appreciate that. By the same token, I am advising uh, a number of different technology companies that are operating in the, in the advertising space. And I can see the value that's being uh, added. But I think the way to navigate between those two things is to figure out what, what are the jobs to be done, right? I love that I need phrase. To, yeah, I need to have my, ad, I need to serve an ad. Into, okay, you need an ad server. Uh, I want to buy uh, on an auction basis. I want to buy in the open web. Okay, you need a, a, a DSP. Um, you know, I want to have access to greater inventory or I want to have access to data. So if, if you can answer those questions very much with a very clear point of view that says, this is the job that I'm doing, this is the need that I'm fulfilling, then it becomes much easier to say, do I need this That's thing or not? Yeah. And then evaluating the, the different, and where I think it, it gets very difficult for people on the, on the advertiser side is, there's just an explosion of different uh, technology and data opportunities and they can't even figure out if they need them, let yeah. alone uh, be able to figure out which ones they need. It's, and and I've spoken to CMOs recently, I kind of went out to a group of CMOs that I've interviewed to the podcast and yeah. just asked them, you know, what role technology is playing in, in their day, right, yeah. every day. Yeah. And kind of the, the message that came back was, the C-suite are asking us about technology. Yeah. They're coming to us and they feel the onus is on the CMO to be providing answers yeah. to, the, to yeah. the technology question. Yeah. Yeah. But they're completely overwhelmed. Yeah. They're completely baffled by everything that's going on. Yeah. They're, you know, one of them said, you know, all the emails I get saying this is the solution you need, I can't even read them. Yeah. So like they're, it, it's such an interesting and challenging dynamic for yeah. CMOs where they're being asked to own it. They feel like they should own it, yeah. but they can't, they don't have the capacity to own it. Any advice? Well, uh, to CMOs in particular. Yeah. Well, I would say don't feel that you need to become a CIO or a CTO overnight um, because those are, are very different roles. I would, I would stay true and keep faith in your core marketing disciplines, especially if those marketing disciplines over the, in the past have been used to drive business results. And I think it's very tempting to almost like be bedazzled by the jazz hands of a new yeah. piece of te technology. And actually, you've got to keep your feet on the ground and say, okay, my business is in this position. And, and, and some, things, some things haven't changed. You know, household penetration is still a, a factor yeah. in driving business growth. Profitability is still a factor in driving business growth. Market share, market size, all of those things, all those underlying things haven't changed in terms of determining the success of your business from a revenue and profit perspective. But the tools on how you deliver some of those things may have done. Yeah. But I think that the, the layer in between is, and I'll give you a good example, if, if a brand wants to maintain and grow household penetration, then the number of people you reach is gonna be a fairly important metric and yeah. goal and objective for your teams quite how you deliver on that in a world of fragmented media and and the impossible virtual impossibility of measurement cross media measurement although there are some being strides being made in that area now you just have to almost in a way stick to your guns and say okay what am i doing i'm still trying to get reach yeah i might be trying to deliver it in an effective way and that's why i think don't be don't be distracted by some in-process metrics like for example attention is great that's, yeah. that's a great way for to optimize your delivery but i don't think it's necessary and then in itself so what are the three four or five things from a media perspective that you know are absolutely going to drive growth and then stick to that so like yeah it's almost like the technology might be part of the answer but it's not the question no exactly yeah, yeah. exactly um you're going to talk am i right in saying you're going to speak about the future of measurement and how advertisers are in the driving seat oh am i so oh, today, uh, today no, or later this week I, I thought later this week that was going to be something no no weird. i can i can definitely <laughs> look i can definitely talk to that uh i would say well firstly i would say the role of trade associations advertiser trade associations uh is has become absolutely critical now and they've been able to convene advertisers uh, to raise capability 
and to champion select causes, not everything. And you can really see that in the advances in things like brand safety, cross-media measurement, sustainability. And so on cross-media measurement, I, I was, I've been over the course of the last five or 10 years of my career much more associated with, with brand safety and suitability. But I've seen the cross-media measurement work develop from the point of origin to now. And it's been going for five years. Yeah. And so you now have the, the WFA-led uh, Halo project that sits at the center, which is the sort of the common um, infrastructure and code that everyone needs to use so that doesn't get replicated. So that's a huge step forward. You're, you're starting to see proof of concept um, in the UK uh, with Origin, and now just recently the announcement in the US of Aquila. And I think very rapidly you're gonna see another tranche of, of markets, the France's, the Germany's, the Italy's, the Canada's, the Brazil's coming on very quickly on the back of that. I think it's been, the progress there has been absolutely incredible. Right. So five years feels like a, a long time, but to go from a standing start to having real life proof of concept with funding, governance, methodology and technology in place, I think has been incredible. Um, and I think the, the reason it's happened is because advertisers have taken the lead. They've right, said, look, okay. this is really important to us. So you know what, let's just roll up our sleeves and just get involved in, in this area. And I have to say uh, enormous kudos to uh, Stefan and Matt at the WFA because they led that initial right. work with Origin and also to Phil and the team in the UK and Bob and the team in the US. I think they've done a fantastic job. And it's great, you know, if that's been brought into other markets, you mm -hmm. know, because you need that to sure. be across yeah, yeah. everywhere, don't yeah. you? Yeah. yeah, yeah. There's, you know, lots of challenges as well with kind of, you know, how much inventory gets shown to actually real, real people. Is this going to help all that? Like, how are we going to get past that discussion? So the, as that work was progressing and in various working groups, I did hear some feedback, which was, oh, can we measure, you know, this and can we measure, you know, a couple of other things? And they were really disciplined and they said, all we're going to be doing, this is not, we're not creating a new currency to compete with the local JIC currencies in each market. We are producing something that is going to be doing post campaign reporting of reach and frequency. And that data will then help for forward looking planning. And so I think that work is the best of both worlds. They're going to have a panel for calibration and they're going to have census data that's going to be coming in. So as long as that data is vetted and validated before it goes in, and to a large degree it is, then um, then the outputs are gonna be robust. But but I, I can appreciate why you're asking the question yeah. now, because there's lots and lots of questions, particularly in the open web, about um, verification, about fraud, uh, about suitability, particularly in, in user yeah. I mean, I think that's a whole nother topic but I would say that given the high bar that the advertisers and the trade associations have set for, for that work, then I, I have a lot of faith in it. Which is good, that's great news. I mean, having, you know, everyone kind of rowing in behind it and, mm -hmm. and having faith faith in it. Um, the, you, you've talked, I've, I've heard you speak in other places about kind of maybe the, the future of talent in, yeah. in the media landscape. Is there, is there a crisis? Like, I don't want to misquote you in saying there's a crisis, or have you concerns about where it's going? I, well, there's definitely a debate that's been, that is uh, very, very current. Um, it's a, a work stream that a number of the big trade associations are looking at. And I think that at various points in the ecosystem, there's an acknowledgement that, hang on a sec, are we really doing the best by the talent that's in our business and actually the talent in our business is the one sort of ownable commodity yeah. and if we're not looking after that and curating it for the longer period then is the business as a whole very sustainable and I know for a fact I can't name them specifically but a number of large advertisers who've gone through pitches in, in recent years have said okay it's actually much harder than I thought to get good quality talent on, onto my business. Right. So that's prompted a discussion that's very, very current at the moment along the lines of like what's contributing to that. Is it, is it do advertisers have to take some responsibility for that? Um, do agencies have to take responsibility for that? And I think that you'll start to see some work coming out in, in the next uh, weeks and months 
that is very much about setting expectations for both advertisers and, and, and agencies. And like one example is still very much work in progress, but one example is advertisers committing to give enough time and space to agencies in order for them to do their best work for okay. the advertisers. Yeah, yeah. So if we can get to that kind of sentiment, then I think that we can at least start to address some of the problems. I think, I think it's, it's going to be a challenging area, uh, particularly with the economics of the, the industry as a whole, particularly the way that the agencies make money at the moment. Hard. Uh, it's, it's very hard and, and a big percentage of their, of their cost base is people. And I think it's going to be very hard with, uh, with grappling with the, the opportunities, uh, let's say, of, of, of AI. Yeah. So I, d I don't think it's job done but at least we are very cognizant of the problem and that there are many people now that are coming together to see if there's a way that we can address that in the way that we address other challenges like brand safety, suitability, yeah. and cross-media measurement. And is the, I guess, are there, are there, do you see differences in markets across the world and kind of that talent? I haven't. Have you not? No, no. I, I just think that, I mean, clearly there are cultural differences uh, between markets, but I think that people are an important part of, the, of our businesses uh, everywhere you go. Um, and I guess, look, yeah, again, even with the technology, we're still going to need people to use the technology. Like, the technology is a tool. Like, yeah. Like, yeah. So yeah. it's not. Um, well, well, one of the companies I'm advising has uh, made a great point, which is that um, if everyone's using, you know, if everyone's using different models, but they're all being trained by the same data, <laughs> then are they all going to come out with the same, same. The same responses? Yeah. And, and I think that there are many advocates in the business who say that the 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 X factor is going to be the the human capital the human, that yeah. you're, you're applying, and the, the sparks of creativity are going to come from that. Otherwise, it's going to be paint by numbers. I well, think, otherwise, you could actually you could argue that you could get a media plan out of AI, out of, out of ChatGPT. Like, do you know what I mean? But like, you don't. I you don't could. want that. Yeah, you could. You could get a media plan that's uh, come from a, a, a large language model. You could get uh, a piece of AI that's actually managing the campaign. Yeah. But I think that there are, what's that thing that people say? Uh, AI is not going to take your job. Someone that uses AI, AI is going to yeah, yeah, take yeah. your job. I agree. So, so I definitely. that's the case. Um, <laughs> anything else you're looking forward to then at Cannes? Uh, well, for me, uh, Cannes is... Um, is the, in many ways, the sort of Super Bowl of, of for many of us, and I, and I really feel a sense of responsibility that we're a we're extremely privileged to be here. Secondly, there's a huge investment in time and money to, to get here and, and be here because it's not it's not cheap to, yeah, yeah. to turn up to can, and so therefore I feel a responsibility to make the most of that. So my diary is my schedule throughout the whole week is completely packed. Um, and I'm trying to see as many people as I can, and that's either current advisory clients, potential advisory clients, uh, ex-colleagues of mine, uh, vendors, platforms, yeah. agencies. Uh, I want to stay current, so I want to stay connected to people, and I want to make sure that I keep abreast of opportunities. Yeah, how do you kind of stay on top of everything now? Uh, <laughs> <laughs> that's hard. Uh, I, I think there are some really good podcasts out there. Uh, and there are many people out there that are a lot smarter than I am and much more expert in, in the more kind of technical areas of our business. Uh, I think Ari Paparo and, and Eric Franchi do a fantastic podcast with uh, Marketecture. I think that works. This podcast, yeah, of course. Yeah, of course. Well, of course. You know, there are other <laughs> podcasts that are available. Uh, I, so I think uh, podcasts are a great way to you know, be on the treadmill and listen to something or what the dog. Yeah. And so it's, it, it's a great time saver um, and so I do that a lot I do read uh, I read Digiday and Ad Exchanger and uh, I stay in contact with you know a number of journalists uh, trade magazines at, at Age and and some of the, the big kind of national yeah. and international titles so I still kind of keep connected there um, and I just try and and spend as much time as with as smart as smart people as, as I possibly can well as I've just done for the last however long that's very uh, kind Jerry thank that's you that's very very kind I really you. appreciate and you know like you're saying podcasts are a great way and this is a great way you know for people listening and watching this to actually just learn from your insights and you know get it was my pleasure really really appreciate you taking the time thanks pleasure. a million cheers cheers
Well, on to the second part of today's episode. And this is being recorded post CAN. Um, when we were over at CAN, we tried to catch up and record this uh, segment, but it just wasn't possible, mostly because the guys at uh, Heineken Ireland were busy picking up far too many awards. And that is what we're going to talk about today. I'm catching up with Mark Noble from Heineken Ireland and Peter Dabin from Publicist Dublin to talk about the multi-award winning pub museum. It was one of the highest awarded ca uh, campaigns at Canline and set a new Irish record for winning the most Canlines for a single campaign. It won four gold and four silver uh, at Can 2024. So in this segment, we're going to chat to uh, Mark and Pete about kind of the background to the campaign, the business challenge they were trying to overcome, how the agency uh, set about kind of creating the campaign, where the shared ambition and the first conversation came about uh, in relation to Can. I think you'd be surprised where that came into the conversation. We talk a lot about relationships and the important relationships of agency and client and how they are built over time. And you'll hear and you'll kind of see in this segment as well and kind of the conversation and the interaction between Pete and Mark, how that relationship is really has been built over, over an extended period of time and the importance of that. We are far too transactional sometimes. Um, we also will just catch up on kind of how you can think about that shared ambition and you know, how great creative work can lead to great commercial outcomes. And trust me, Heineken Ireland care about commercial outcomes. So enjoy this segment with award-winning, I'll say it again, multiple award-winning uh, Heineken Ireland, Publicist Dublin, uh, Mark Noble and Peter Dabble. Mark, Peter, thanks a million for joining me on That's What I Call Marketing. We are no longer at Cannes. It's a distant memory, but you know, you have a truckload of awards that you brought back with you. Uh, I joked when I was over there saying, Mark, you were sent over with an extra suitcase to bring back all the different awards. So first of all, congratulations on winning uh, so much at Cannes for both yourselves at, at Heineken, publicists, and obviously there was an involvement there as well with Think House as well. So great, great to see. And for anyone who's maybe not familiar, um, Mark, I might start with you from the client side. You just give us a bit of a background to the multi-award winning pub museum. I can say that over and over again, by the way, just, just right. for all of it. Good range, isn't it? It sounds good. Um, yeah, like listen to this, this something that, that we probably had a first conversation with the guys at, at Publicis sort of just after Christmas. Um, and it, it very much followed, I suppose, from our perspective, a, a kind of a, a slight shift in our strategy post COVID where we, we were trying to balance, I guess, B2C marketing with a little bit of B2B as well. So post COVID, particularly with our entree customers, there was a, a huge focus from, from us as a business and how we support the bars and support pubs around the country, because it's a, it's a difficult, I guess, time to be a public in, in terms of the, the, the kind of the economic pressure. And coming out of COVID, we, we, we've done, you know, three or four different initiatives, um, from our unwasted beer sort of campaign initiative that can, and just after COVID, which also we, we had a little bit of success with in Cannes, which was great. But we also had, I guess, you know, a focus on encouraging people to join the the, the bar trade industry with with a bar experiences campaign. Um, and this was, I guess, the next iteration of that. Um, and I think, you know, when we were signing off our marketing plan sort of in sort of September, October last year, our big focus as a team was very much on quality. And, and the, the, I guess, showcasing the, the craft and the commitment and the passion that we have for our beer. And that campaign was launching in April and we kind of sat with, uh, Peter and, and Jer Rowe and, in actually in toners just after Christmas and, and Jer sort of quipped and he said, Mark, it's, you know, quality is brilliant and pints are brilliant, but they're not, they're, it's not great if, if pubs are closing. And what are, what's our plans to continue that focus on B2B and focus on kind of that, I guess, that back the bars sort of platform that we've developed. And that was the first conversation. And then I suppose the brief to, to publicists, and I say brief because it sounds quite formal. I think it was a, a series of WhatsApp conversations to say, okay, so this, the energy in our business is very much on our big scale sort of a uh, quality program. But what else can we do that kind of, I guess, brings a little bit of the, the fairy dust into our plan and a bit of the excitement and the, 
the magic of Heineken as a brand and how we can kind of bring that to life through through continue to show our support to to pubs. Amazing. I I love so many pieces of that. First of all, you know, Pete, the client that wants to brief you in toners, which is a really famous <laughs> Dublin pub, is 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 wonderful. And then getting to the point, and we'll get into the relationship a bit, but I think that point of actually briefs being almost through WhatsApp, being I'm sure something was written down at some point, but that idea of kind of like formative idea and you can continue that conversation is is amazing. But Pete, like how did you guys react again? You've been working on kind of some of the pieces for a while, but that idea that Mark just has just talked about, kind of how did you take that away and bring it back to the agency? Yeah, I suppose it's a it's a co-creation piece, I'll be honest. So of course we have the really, really tight relationship with Mark and the guys at Heineken. Ireland, but also, um, with Le Pub in Milan, we do, we work on these things together. So when Wasted Beer, we worked on that together. This is a very different, uh, project, obviously. And, and, it, and it evolves at the rate of knots. Like you really have to be quick and on it and willing to answer WhatsApp messages at all hours, really all hours. But I think that is genuinely, um, so important, but. You know, when we kind of had the idea, uh, there is a real sense of, okay, there is a real magic around this, you know, Heineken is, is all about sociability, you know, and protecting that sociability and any barriers that are standing in the way of that, removing them. So this just felt like when we landed, it's just such an amazing fit for the brand. It's something the brand just needs to do. And when you kind of get in a room and you tell people about it, it's just, there was this sense of magic. And we can't help but go all in on it, all in on it. And that's what it really, really takes for a project of this magnitude. Yeah. And for anyone who hasn't yet seen it, just briefly explain the idea that like how it came to life. Do you want me to take it, Mark? Yeah. Yeah. yeah so I suppose the, the, the landscape is, you know, that bars need support, obviously. Um, so obviously there are bars that are closing, uh, older bars that have served the, their communities for generations. And these bars are pl pe places that people would go to, uh, to share stories. And there is so much, I mean, Mark always says, if these walls could talk, you know, the Irish bar is just, it's a cultural institution. So when you kind of read about, you know, the bars under threat and the fact that these bars have been around for so long and on the other side, there's this, there are other historic institutions museums that are actually protected in many different ways in the forms of benefits and grants and everything. But what if we were to reframe it, you know, look around these bars, when you walk in, when you walk into toners and, you know, you talk to, uh, Mick Quinn, um, about the different aspects, whether it's a painting or whether it's a snug where Oliver saying, uh, Gogarty would have sat and had his, you know, only drink, um, I think that's, I think that's what Mick Quinn would probably pick me up on that. You're completely wrong, Peter, is what he'd say. He's, he's, he's the curator. He knows a lot more than me. But when you go into these places, you just, it does feel like it, there's so much history there. So then it was a case of, right, well, what if we could turn these pubs into museums? What if we could use AOR technology to actually completely reframe it? And for, for, so we could actually share and impart all these stories that Mick uh, would have brought us through when we go in or that the guys in Sean's bar or mother Max would have imparted to us. Um, that was the sort of the, that was the kernel of it. That sort of insight. What if we were to reframe it in a way to protect these bars and keep them going for another couple hundred years and thousands of years, you know, and it's just, yeah. So it's, that's kind of the, the essence of it. it and it is brilliant because it just changes the, the dynamic perspective of the bar. You know, you have people, maybe tourists who come to certain pubs in Dublin and go like that, you know, we go for certain reasons, but all these bars, you know, like local to me, there's a, a bar probably lost a bit of it, it, it's heritage feel, but like it's over 125 years old and you're like, oh my God, like, you know, and you, 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 yeah. you kind of need that because it's, as you say, people, like it's more about the stories and then the stories that are told by groups of people and friends, like the coming together. And, and how we told it as well, I think that was the important point from, from my perspective and, and the, the team was, as you rightly say, like Toners is an example that Toners has stood on, on, on Bagot Street for longer than the United States of America has existed. And, but how we told the story, because, you know, Heineken, we, we, we looked to ourselves as a modern progressive brand mm. 
and and being able to i guess leverage the technology then through ar keeps our kind of lens on it in a modern progressive way so i think it was trying to marry up the old and the tradition with the new and the modern and kind of create that that uh that interest um so it's so it's that's where the magic i suppose came in for for from my perspective Jeez, guinness must be raging and you don't have to comment on that it's at what point then did a conversation come up about this being something that would be can worthy like was it part of that original we're in towners let's do something fucking amazing that's going to win a can quite the opposite actually um, because as, as I said, we, you know, our, the majority of our focus was on a, a campaign launching on the 9th of April. And, um, uh, I also get a little bit, cause I think as a client, you can also spot sort of ideas that come in from agencies. Um, and I can talk of experience of being in Dublin and also working in London where ideas that were created to win an award was the first priority and, and you can kind of see through it then. Um, so very much from our perspective, it's how do we make something that tangibly can make a difference to perceptions of our brand, both with consumers, but also with publicans. Uh, and I think that's the, the bit from my side where it was when, you know, Peter and Jer and, and myself, we started having conversations with, with Mick and the guys in and Mother Max and, 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 and Sean's bar and Athlone, where you could see the passion that they had, that we actually think, well, actually from a brand perspective, this is really powerful. And then I think, you know, Peter can talk a little bit in terms of when we kind of went further down the, the road with it and we kind of, I guess, molded the a germ of an idea into something that felt much bigger. Um, then you suppose, you you know, just as we kind of came to launch, it was then the, the, the opportunity, I suppose, uh, became clear in terms of, you know, how impactful this could be from an awards perspective. Yeah, you kind of feel like, God, there's got to be easier ways to win a can. <laughs> Because it's a lot of work and it was six months, uh, of, yeah, a lot of work. So I think it's, listen, I, I think if you kind of set out the very beginning, we want to do can winning work. I, I think that's the wrong way to go about it. I think you want to start from a, let's solve a real business problem. Let's find a real true insight that build up and do the most powerful idea that'll come. You know what I mean? The, the, the can stuff will, that's a byproduct of doing a really, really strong campaign that resonates and that really, yeah gets into culture. Um, so it was only maybe later, uh, in the sort of when we were actually working through. So as Mark was saying, we were going out and we were talking to the publicans, we were finding the stories, we were, you know, typing them up, we were, uh, crafting the stories, we were sending them out. So the AOR is being built. So the wheels were already in motion. Um, myself and Jer, we kind of, um, we sit with the publicist GPC where basically you can sit amongst the the CCOs from around the network and you'd get to discuss what's the best piece of work and how can we improve at that okay. point, you know, I, I remember going to Paris and I was kind of shared the idea uh, with them and you could just kind of see, wow, the love for something like, because specifically this start, this is starting here in Ireland and there's just such a magic around the Irish pub. These are people from all over the world, mm -hmm. yeah, uh, from Brazil, from, uh, from Asia, parts of Europe and. They're just like, God, the Irish pub, like if you could bottle that, you know, it's Mark often says it's, you know, it's often, uh, imitated, never replicated. Yeah. So there is this sort of, oh, wow, there's just so much to this idea. And then at that point, obviously the, you know, that it's going to do well, but I think it's just, it's, uh, it's never the reason at the beginning. Do you know what I mean? It's a, it's a byproduct of just doing really strong work, I think. And did then when you, when, when did the conversation happen then between client and agency to say, like, we actually think this is can worthy, you know, at what point did that come up in the conversation with Mark, you know, Heineken is you, like, it's a very commercial business, right? And so you're, you've got results that you I mean, I can only imagine. And I know well how Heineken operates, like you're measuring everything and it's not awards. So at what point did that conversation happen? And then from maybe both sides. How did you bring that to, to the kind of business and, and say, this is what something we, we want to do. Yeah. I think from our perspective, you know, I didn't really have a conversation with Peter and Jer until after the, the, the kind of the public GPC, which kind of was what mid March sort of time frames, if I remember right. So 
it was kind of, you know, we'd been working on it for, for, as I said, the first conversation was just after Christmas. So it was, we had, we had the idea, we had our, we knew when we wanted to launch it. So it was probably whenever the, the kind of the, that conversation had, I think we also might've been back in, in toners. Um, a lot of, a lot of the great conversations happen in toners. So, um, it was after that where Jerry said, listen, we don't want this to be a distraction, but if you're okay with it, we, we, we'd love to put it forward into can. And we've had the conversations with the network and, and we believe that it's, 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 it's a story worth sharing even broader. Yeah. Um, and, and, but that was kind of the first conversation. I, and, and from my perspective, it was very much, listen, guys, I've got a lot of things going on over here. If you want to enter it, brilliant. And if there's anything you need from us, then, then, then we'll support it. But, um, again, let's not get distracted by a submission. Um, because we need, we still need to deliver and launch this and then launch everything else. As you said, we, you know, we've got, we've got very much of a, a growth mindset at Heineken and trying to, I guess, strengthen our perception and our, our relationship with consumers and customers. So that was still always the priority. And I think it was then over to Peter and the guys at Publicis to, to kind of do the hard yards of the submissions. Yeah. I think there's a lot of work into, the, into those, Peter, like, how, you know, again, in the agency, how did that kind of, um, uh, yeah, I suppose when like coming back from the, the GPC, I suppose I just had a real feeling, uh, and we were, we were talking about it, Jer, and with the MD, Jer Rowe and a few of us, and we were kind of like, this is really, uh, this an idea that has real power. And, uh, if we're ever going to, you know, get behind something like this, it, this is, this is the one, you know, it's, uh, we saw real potential in it, but of course we had to keep focus on other projects. Like you say, there was creds going on and there's other things. So, uh, but you're very much, it's, you gotta be, um, again, it's the WhatsApp conversation. A lot of this kind of happens after hours as well. And it's on weekend yeah. and it's, and it does take that level of commitment. You know what I mean? It's, it's, you do have to be available to, uh, hop on and talk to the, the AR developers in Poland or whatever it is, or you need to be able to talk to, uh, Milan, uh, because as I said, this is, this is co-created together. There was so much back and forth, uh, between us. Um, so yeah, it's, it takes a lot of work and you gotta be willing to, uh, to do that and, and, and keep up with it. Even today, those WhatsApp threads are still pinging with, we should do this, we should do that, you Thank know? You. So it's. Thank because yeah. that relationship, I think getting that point in a relationship is like, is really important and it, it's not easy, you know, and I'm sure even during this, there were moments where on both sides and you don't have to answer this, you were ready to kill each other. Like, you know, what the, like all that, you know, it happens and you know, you know, we've been there. <laughs> it's tough. It's not easy, but getting to that, like, it's that level of trust. Like, were there things along the way that happened? I'm not necessarily maybe on this campaign, but things that happened in the relationship that kind of changed the dynamic that, that helped you build that level of we're okay to be on WhatsApp on Friday night at nine o'clock because we all care deeply about it. I think it's it's funny. Um, my wife my wife sometimes teases me to say I WhatsApp Jero more than I, I WhatsApp her, uh, which I don't know if that's a that's a good thing or a bad thing. Um, but I think from my perspective, like we've worked, we've worked with publicists Dublin, um, for, for a long time now and, and that trust is not something that you build up, yeah. you know, from one, in one campaign, it's, it's kind of year in, year out of doing some, you know, work, work that works. Yeah. Um, but was there, was it all plain student? Like, no, like, I think like I'm a, I'm a marketeer. I, I don't, I, there was a lot of leaping of into the unknown on this project in particular and a lot of, um. I guess nervousness because also we, we wanted to make sure, and I wanted to make sure and, and, and the team from Heineken who worked on it, that this, this was back to that excitement of the publicans mm. that we were treating the publicans with the respect that they deserve in bringing this idea to life, that this couldn't be seen as a gimmick and this couldn't be seen as a, seen as, as something that was, a. Uh, 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 something that wasn't real and, and, but, but to do that, then there needed to be a lot of trust in the experts, you know, Peter kind of mentioned, you know, the AR experts in Poland, the, the kind of the, the independent sort of heritage experts, the historians, the, the people around the project who contributed, like you just had to, you had to take that leap of faith because frankly, I, I, I'm not that expert. I, my team's not expert. Peter's not that expert all the time. Jer's definitely not that expert. Mm -hmm. um, 
but it was it was having the confidence that we had the right people on us. Um, I think that was key, but it was it wasn't you know it it wasn't an easy thing as Peter said. There was a hell of a lot of work to to get there, and a hell of a lot of messages late into the evenings, and uh, even understanding and playing with the technology. That was probably the biggest nervousness, you know, when you go into an outlet and you go into a pub and you've made this commitment to to uh, an independent family run business, which a lot of these publicans are, that you're going to do this thing in their establishment. The nervousness when it, if, if, you know, and there is teething problems with, with technology all the time, you know, that's when I probably got a little bit te- uh, tense, Peter. Yeah. Yeah. I suppose the, to that point, the trust is everything, I suppose, really. And it's like the uncertainty, there was a lot of uncertainty along the way, but it is a case of you're all just kind of looking at each other. Like from the beginning, we kind of said, we're all in, we're all in this together. We all want this to work. And, but in that sort of. You know, when you're slightly out of your breath, David Bowie has a lovely quote about it, but that's where the magic can happen, where we're kind of like, none of us have ever attempted to turn a pub into a museum. There are so many, there are so many unknowns, but that's it's a where idea. Yeah. yeah, but that's, and that's where, but that's where the magic is. So yeah, there's like, yeah, there were moments with the tech in particular. Yeah. Where you're kind of, you're going around first day, you're like, is it going to work? Is it going to work? It, it does work, but it's, but it is, you're putting trust in other people. And that's what they, you know, Mark and the guys are putting trust in us and Le Pub and, and with Heineken Global as well. We're all trusting each other. And it's a, it's a case of, it takes an army, as I said, to, to make an idea like this work and to, there's one thing having the idea. There's the other thing implementing, implementing. Yeah, yeah, yeah. The worst thing about pitches, isn't it? You've all, when you, when yeah. you win, you don't do it. Mm. Horrible part. Um, but it's amazing. And it's like, cause getting to the point of actually like caring enough about each other, it, you know, yes, trust, it's respect, but it's caring, it, you know, it's, it's a wonderful place to get to in a relationship. And it allows you then, as you both have said, this is all very commercial, like it's business. It has to drive results. And that actually, I love that when you're talking about the distraction, this can couldn't be a distraction. It was never a distraction. It was, a, it ended up being something that was at the other side, almost kind of, there's something really powerful in this. Then, you know, do, do we put it in for can? And then obviously you did put it in for can and it won, I'll say it again, a, a truckload out there. And um, I'd love to hear about kind of the impact that has had back in the business for both of you. Like, you know, when you were Mark texting, you know, Fiona or Sharon are going, we've just, we've just won again. Yeah, How, you know what was the reaction in the business? And uh, I, I think before maybe I answer that, Connor, I think as well, just back to your point about caring, Heineken, we have a, a kind of a phrase like it's our mindset is daring and caring, and I think this project is is a perfect encapsulation of of both of those, I guess, behaviours and philosophies as a business, and I think that's that's really important because, as Peter said, it's not something we'd ever done before, um, and we needed that trust and that care that 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 we we put in the people. I mean, you know, um, I'm I'm lucky enough to be in a WhatsApp group with with Sharon and Fiona and our commercial director Jason, and and we have uh, multiple conversations any given week about different things that we're seeing in the market or seeing in 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 the performance of the brand. The excitement, and I think it was a shared pride as well, because this was a this was a brand led idea collaborated with our on trade sort of sales reps, our on trade commercial team. Um, our on-trade on trade customers that this wasn't you know it wasn't the marketing team over here doing something uh, shiny and fluffy like this felt real uh, and and I think that's where the pride in the business and you know I've got people from the brewery um, kind of calling me and, and maybe they don't know what can is but they know that we it's a pretty big deal yeah, yeah. and this is brilliant because this is something that makes you feel proud to work for Heineken uh, and, and you can see it as well and when you speak to you know, consumers, otherwise known as people, uh, you see them, you know, you can see the smile on people's face whenever you tell them this idea uh, and, and then to, to kind of cap it off with, with a, a few bits of shiny metal is it just makes all the hard work and the, you know, the, the, the perseverance through it. And, and for people in my team, like, you know, Rachel Crawley, who, who worked on this uh, tirelessly as well, she was a, she was a representative of, 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 
Ireland in the Young Lions in, in Cannes in 2017. Oh, and she described this as it's almost full circle. Yeah. And, and, and the pride that I can see and, and the effort that she put into this as well was, was incredible. So I think it's just a sense of pride and, and particularly then from us, you know, we're, we're very proud of Heineken in Ireland, but Heineken globally, I think the pride that the, you know, uh, Nabil Nassar, who's the global head of, of Heineken in, in, in Amsterdam, obviously was in Pan with us. And for us to be able to say as a, a small rock on the edge of Europe, that we were the biggest contributor to Heineken's global success as can. That's pretty special. Yeah. Um, and for this campaign to be the most awarded campaign in can is, is something that you'll, 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 um, you'll remember it for a long time. I, I just wish my mum knew what can was so that she could understand it. But she kind of looked at me as uh, she didn't really understand what was going on and more focus on, on other uh, members of the family and the successes. So I'll try and educate her uh, over the next little while. Well, I speak, yeah, just with that, I remember one of the young lines, I can't remember who it was, was saying to me that they explained to their parents like the Olympics of advertising. So given your connection to the Olympics, yeah, uh, maybe yeah. that'll, that'll do the job. The closest, the closest I'll ever get to the Olympics, but, uh, but I, yeah, it was, it was, yeah, it's brilliant. It's a, it's a, I think pride is the big word. And I think that's as, as a team, as a company and as a group of people, I think that's, that's, that's it. That's what it's, demonstrated for us. Pete, how about you and kind of the, the publicist Dublin side? Yeah, it's funny, like after uh, one of the nights after the award shows, we kind of went for, for a bite to eat and I remember just talking to Jer and we were, I just had one of these, you know, where do we go from here? Sort of. And he kind of, and his response was, well, I think there's a party in the villa about two miles up where I, uh, but seriously, yeah, it's, it's huge. It's a huge moment for, for, for the agency and and for, for Heineken, um, I suppose it's, and also it's a massive win for Ireland. I'll be honest, like, cause getting to go to, I saw you there, Connor, in terms of the creative as native lunch on the second night after the, the first win, genuinely seeing the outpouring of support from, from clients and agencies in Ireland, people were just like, I'm so happy for you. We're a small island. Yeah. We, we all know each other and it was a genuine sort of, we're delighted for you. In the same way that um, years ago in uh, Droga, five um, multiple projects did great, boys and girls did great with the three connected and I genuinely just delighted. Someone's up there, uh, Ireland has been represented. So this was, uh, this is our year and it was a great year, but I honestly feel it, it um, forces all of us to kind of, it raises the bar and it goes, okay, we can, we can do it. When we really apply ourselves, we... We can do it and we should, you know. And I spoke to a few people out there, you know, and I got definitely, like there was more people from Ireland to Cannes this year. I definitely felt that everyone was, was thrilled. And being honest with you, like, you know, I worked at agencies a long time ago and that was not the sentiment. People were just ready to like stab each other in the back. And so I love that shift and I feel it's more genuine. I think genuinely people are like, you know, we're happy for people who are doing good work because it's raising the bar and, you know, if we want to be seen as a place where people can get and do amazing creative work, that's going to have business impact. I think we need this and we need more and more agencies. And some of the ones I spoke to out there were like, yeah, we want to be here next year. And it's not for the sake of being there. It like, to your point, it's not for the sake of, we want to, we want to have a can line on our wall. That's, that's great as a, as a, as an output, but that ambition to be doing incredible work because of the commerciality and the commercial returns. And look, people criticize can and say, you know, it, you know, it, it, it's not important for, for kind of commercial outcomes, but I think there's certain, you know, certainly a, a strong role for creativity, depending on who, which day of the week and who you talk to. So, totally. Yeah. I mean, the, the, you know, the, uh, the data is there to show the direct correlation between a great creative and, you know, business results. So it's like, the, it is there. It is like I was talking to one of the guys before, uh, Pedro was on, on the team. You know, it is a bit of a fashion show, of course. You know what I mean? Really? It's, um, certain there are can projects, of course, and it's not, but yeah. it does, I think it, it forces you to raise your game in even those ones that aren't the big meaty projects. It just goes, it forces you to lift the standard across the board, uh, which is great, you know, um, because it should be, I mean, obviously there are the bigger projects, but you want to try and just raise it. Yeah. Across all of your clients and yeah. it's, it's inspire for, for great, for great work. And 
Well, listen, thanks a million. We didn't get to do this out in the sun on a beach with the ice cold Heineken in our hands, but uh, it's been great to to catch well, next year. Yeah, next, next year, year I'll be on the offset. Uh, I li- thanks so much for taking the time out. I appreciate it. Um, congratulations, like honestly, massive congratulations to everybody involved. And it is great. It is great for um, for this island. Like you know, we should be punching above our weight. We do it in so many other areas of creativity, you know, and I keep saying that I talked to Karen Martin about this as well. And this is kind of the, the, maybe kind of a jumping off point, standing on the shoulders of giants. So let's see, we can do more next year. So congratulations and thanks a million for joining me. Thanks, Mark. Thank you. Well, I hope you enjoyed that segment with uh, Mark and Peter. And again, as I said at the start, you can kind of hear and see how their relationship has developed over time and how they interact with each other. We're talking here about kind of the WhatsApp brief, you know, that takes time to get to. I don't believe there wasn't something written down. At some point, there obviously was, but it's those conversations that's sitting in the pub, it's sitting over the coffee. One of my, the very first episode of That's What I Call Marketing was with John Goldstone, and he talked about the exact same relationship with Lucky Generals when he was at Hobus and creating Go On Lad, the incredible piece of work that transformed that business. But it was a conversation. It was the curiosity, the insight that came from those conversations. Um, I love as well in in this piece how they talked about can not being a distraction. So even when the conversation about, you know, can worthy work came up, they were all so focused on this being great work for commercial outcomes for the right reasons. You know, creativity for the sake of creativity is, is it's art, right? And And in our business, we need to drive revenue we need to drive sales we need to have commercial outcomes and you can tell you can tell from talking to pete who's the creative director he cares about that as much as mark does because he knows that impact in the business is really important and look it goes to show that you know it doesn't matter where you're listening to this from what brand you're in what market you're in you know having an ambition to win an award at can uh, is possible um but it comes from the great brief the insight commercial outcomes um, and so I hope people listening to this feel inspired by the relationship that Mark and Pete and, and the two organizations have built over time inspired to think about creating award-winning work and look I'm Irish I love the industry here and I love the fact that people I spoke to at can have that ambition and I think that is something that we need more and more we need to stop being apologetic Stop being apologetic for how we think about our work. Stop being apologetic for the fact that we can do amazing work and show it off in the world and be proud. And, you know, if people are going to knock us down, let them, you know, let them knock us down. But let's be really proud of the incredible work that we can do in this country. And it takes both clients and agencies to want to get to that. Rant over. Uh, So thank you so much for joining me on this episode of That's What I Call Marketing. Um, we are back next week with more from the Can Sessions. Yes, we are coming back. So thanks a million for tuning in. Uh, for me, your host, Connor Byrne. Take care.